Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, June 14th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, the Russians hack the DNC, and the White House blames the Republicans. Meanwhile, reliable intelligence sources say the Russian government might also release Hillary Clinton's emails that they claim were intercepted from the time she was U.S. Secretary of State. Then, Special Forces operator and UFC fighter Tim Kennedy says political correctness kills. Heaven forbid you actually say something that's not politically correct, then you're a bigot then you're a racist. You know, we're trying to be nice, we don't want to offend anybody, and by doing that, we're getting weaker. Stop being and call things how you see them. And Rolling Stone magazine demands the repeal of the Second Amendment. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Security experts have admitted that Russian government hackers have been able to penetrate the DNC's website. And of course, what did they do? They stole opposition research on Donald Trump. Now, this is the second time we're hearing about the DNC website being hacked into, uh, but the reports are saying that the Russian government hackers got into the computer network of the DNC. They gained access to the entire database of opposition research on Donald Trump. They also thoroughly compromised the system, uh, so they were able to read all emails and chat traffic. And uh, now they say they, they weren't able to get in and get any information, of donor information, financial, personal, things like that. So this is where they suggest this is traditional espionage and not the work of criminal hackers because, of course, they would have gone after that donor financial information. Uh, but this is just one of several political institutions that have been targeted, um, including Hillary Clinton's website, as well as Donald Trump, were also targeted. And they apparently had access to the DNC's website for about a year, and they were just expelled over the past weekend in a major computer cleanup campaign. This is according to committee officials. And of course, you were never warned about it, even though a lot of people continued to sign up, give them all their personal information uh, to the DNC. So this is a second time that they were breached. And they say, you know, this is just a, an example of how the Russian government wants to see the inner workings of the political system and understand the weaknesses, um, the strengths of future potential candidates, which of course is what America does as well. Um, but guess what? So the White House has come out today, the press secretary, Joss Ernest, has come out and blamed the GOP for the breach for a lack of funding. He said that Republicans, for the first time in 40 years, declined to even hold a hearing on that specific budget proposal which means that the president has put forward a specific plan, laid out exactly how he believes we should pay for enhancing our nation's cybersecurity, but the Republicans in Senate, they didn't even want to talk about it. So, you know, that might be true about the president's plan going forward, but that doesn't explain the security breach as it happened and all of the past security breaches that they have experienced. So, you know, it's just like with this attack, they, a lot of people are saying that we need to support Muslims and, and want to look away at the fact that they actually hate gay people. So what do they do? They blame it on the Republicans and blame it on the religious right. So that's what this all is just kind of deflecting here once again. White House blames these security breaches on uh, the Republicans there. So speaking of hacking vulnerable servers, Russia is reportedly set to release Clinton's intercepted emails. Um, now this is according to some intelligence sources, they say the Russian government could in the very near future release the text of email messages that were intercepted from uh, Hillary Clinton's private email server from the time she was U.S. Secretary of State. This would absolutely prove that Secretary Clinton had in fact laid open U.S. secrets to foreign interception by putting highly classified government reports on a private server. And Julian Assange of WikiLeaks has said that indeed if Wiki, WikiLeaks releases these emails, it will prove with enough evidence to indict her. So that will be incredibly interesting. Of course, you know, even with this criminal case, she still is running for president and could very well be our next president. Scary as that sounds. 
Of course, one of the things that I'm sure were on her private server, one of those pesky emails that she hastily deleted, uh, was her foreign donations to the Clinton Foundation, and especially and specifically Saudi Foundation uh, funding. So the Saudis have actually funded 20% of Clinton's presidential campaign. This is according to the Saudi Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He was quoted as saying such. There was a video of him saying that, and it was very briefly reported uh, by the Jordanian Petra news agency, but it was deleted hastily. It was only up there for a very brief amount of time, but a, a snapshot of the original Arabic version was later republished by the Washington-based Institute for Gulf Affairs. Now, the video itself seemed innocent enough. The, the prince was actually talking about how uh, Saudi Arabia has always sponsored both the Republican and Democratic parties of America, and that the kingdom, he was very proud of it because they provided full enthusiasm, 20% of the cost of Hillary Clinton's campaign uh, in the U.S. presidential elections. You know, this is despite the fact that other people don't support her because she's a woman. So they're playing this to show, wow, you know, Saudi Arabia is so great. We want this first lady president. Seems innocent enough, but it's actually quite damning because, as we know, it's illegal for foreign governments um, to fund U.S. presidential campaigns. Ah, but that's how the Clintons get around this thing. Now, let's not forget that in 2008, the Clinton Foundation disclosed that it had accepted up to $25 million from the Saudi kingdom in that same year, of course, the year she was running for president. So we will have more on how the Clinton campaign was funded by 9-11 uh, terrorists coming up in the next segment. Now, the president came out and responded to Donald Trump today saying, you know, this whole thing about trying to force me to say radical Islam, these are not magic words that someone can utter and then make terrorism go away. But apparently he thinks not saying those words is going to ma magically make terrorism go away. Uh, but he also came out and said, if we fall into the trap of painting all Muslims with a broad brush and imply that we are at war with an entire religion, then we are doing the terrorist work for them. But apparently he doesn't realize the irony in painting all gun owners with a very broad brush and denying Americans their rights. Isn't that doing the terrorist work for them? But indeed, this is actually what Rolling Stone is coming out and demanding. They want to repeal the Second Amendment, and they are doing that by promoting a constitutional expert who's advocating for the repeal of the Second Amendment. This is David Cohen, and he's saying, you know, sometimes we just have to acknowledge that the founders and the Constitution are wrong. We need to say loud and clear, the Second Amendment must be repealed. So Cohen says that he teaches the Constitution for a living, but if you actually look at this article, kind of comes under question if that's what he's really all about. He seems as, as much of a constitutional scholar as President Obama because it's more about looking at the Constitution and figuring out how you can misinterpret it. Uh, but one of the big things here, Kit Daniels points out in the article, I highly recommend you read this. It's very informative. Uh, but he goes on to say, I admire the founders for establishing a representative democracy that has survived for over two centuries. Well, a constitutional law professor should know more than anybody that the U.S. was founded as a republic. So that right there is kind of a ringer that this guy has no idea what he's talking about. And he, he, his purpose is to misinterpret the Constitution. But don't question him because he is an expert. And now we're finding out that the Orlando attackers ties to the American suicide bomber or go a little bit deeper uh, than was first suggested. Now, this is also according to a government source who told Fox News that Mateen's name surfaced twice for FBI investigators in the run-up to this attack um, after the first full FBI investigation of Mateen concluded in 2014. His name came up two months later in a second separate FBI investigation of American suicide bomber uh, Moner Abu Saha. He drove 16 tons of explosives into a Syrian government facility on behalf of Al-Qaeda-linked Nusra Front in late May of that year. The men had attended the same Eastern Florida mosque, but the FBI said, you know, that the association was very minimal, uh, but they claimed that Mateen was actually watching videos from the American cleric Anwar al Awalaki, who was an Al-Qaeda terrorist uh, targeted for death by the CIA in 2011. 
And of course, reading Alaki's sermons and watching his videos are among the most common and obvious red flags for homegrown terrorism. And of course, getting multiple visits by the FBI. Uh, if you're getting flagged multiple times to get investigated by the FBI, I think that right there is a red flag. But of course, once again, he was able to slip through the cracks. And now his current wife, who the media has largely overlooked in favor of his other wife, who said that he beat her and she was in an abusive relationship. Well, now they're looking at his current wife, who apparently had prior knowledge of his plans. Um, she actually drove him to the Pulse nightclub on prior occasions, and she was with him when he bought ammunition and a holster. She says that she tried to talk him out of it, uh, tried to talk him out of any attacks. And now uh, officials are saying that she is cooperating with the investigation at this point, but it's a little too late for that kind of is taking away this whole lone wolf theory that they're trying to put out there because, of course, he did go to Saudi Arabia twice. So they're investigating that as well. Now, in Texas today, we had an armed Somalian man take people hostage in a, in a Texas Walmart here. And they're going to probably label this as workplace violence, because even though he had an Arabic note written in the car and they were asking for a Somalian interpreter so they could talk with him during this hostage crisis. Um, and of course, Islam is the number one religion in Somalia. They're probably going to call this workplace violence because he was killed before he could express why exactly he was doing this. And talking about that Muslim ban on people coming in from terrorist hotbeds, Amarillo has the highest rate of refugees in the entire country. Is this coupled with the French terror attack that took place today? Why Hillary and Obama wished us all a happy Ramadan? When you look at that French situation and, and whether or not these people are first or second generation, there's an article uh, that I'm going to talk about today via Drudge Report talking about more than half of the uh, deadly attacks in the last decade have been done by second generation. We're going to talk about why that is. There's a good reason for that. And when we talk about what's going on, I saw comments from people, hey, he wasn't an immigrant. And these guys who shot up Paris weren't immigrants either. That's part of the problem, though, is how they bring the people in. But you got Hillary Clinton coming in and saying gun control is the only way to stop terrorists from getting the tools they need. And it's like, no, it, you have to worry if you're going to let terrorists into your country without any kind of vetting, without any kind of control. The least of your worries is going to be them getting some kind of a semi-automatic weapon. You, what you really need to be worried about is that they're going to come in and use nuclear, biological, or chemical. Those are the real weapons of war. And what we saw in France, we saw a jihadi coming in using the weapons of jihad. What was he using? He was using a knife and he was using Facebook. Now, do we need to ban knives? And do we need to ban Facebook? Are those the problems? He stabs the French officer and the, and this is a police commander. And this guy who committed this uh, terrorist act was under observation already. So even though the police have him under observation, and they always say that, they say, yeah, we knew about him. <laughs> I, I guess they don't want to pretend that they're ignorant. I guess it's better to say you're incompetent, uh, but you need to know everything. <laughs> you just don't want to be, uh, you, you know, I guess that's an excuse for being incompetent. But nevertheless, this guy was a known criminal. They said he was under observation, but he stabs the officer in the stomach, goes into the house, holds his wife hostage, eventually slits her throat in front of the three-year-old child. The two of them are bleeding out in front of the child, and this guy is filming it and putting it on Facebook and encouraging others to do the same. So let me ask you, is the problem a gun? Guns weren't involved there. Oh, the other, the other word, I'm sorry. The guns were involved. At one point, the police showed up and they put an end to it, saving the life of the three-year-old by shooting this guy with a gun. That's where the guns come in. And you see, it's always when the people with guns get there, the good guys with the guns stop the bad guys with the knives, with the nuclear uh, weapons, with the biological weapons, with the chemical weapons, with their guns, whatever they choose to use. The issue is not gun control. The issue is border control. If you refuse to control the border, you will have these problems. As I pointed out, the people who have been responsible for over half of the deadly attacks in the past decade are second generation people like this shooter in Orlando. Why is that? Well, think about it. What are they being taught in school? They're being taught that the U.S. is bad. They're being taught by that by our federally controlled schools. They're being taught that uh, 
white privilege is bad. The founders are bad. Uh, the principles this country was founded upon are bad. They've got their social justice committees that they're now setting up in schools, which sound like some kind of a uh, Marxist nightmare. But of course, they don't want them to identify with America. They don't want them to join America. We used to talk about how America was the great melting pot. Everybody brings something into the country and we all mix it together and we get something that didn't exist before anywhere else, some unique blend of all these backgrounds and cultures. They don't want that. They don't want the melting pot. They want the tossed salad. They want people to remain distinct because if they remain distinct and separate from each other in their own little enclaves or in the case of the Muslims, and their own self-set up and self-maintained uh, ghettos because they don't want to mix with the outside people. And that happens in many cases. They encourage them not to learn the language. They want us to pay for their education in a different language other than English. So they don't even want them to have a common language with us. What was the Tower of Babel about? Oh, you separate people by language and they can't work together. They won't work together. It'll be the foundation of confusion and conflict. And that is what our government is engineering with these people who come in. That's why the second generation is worse than the first. They have no concept of the places that they came from, that even though their parents may not like, they may not feel comfortable in this culture, they know that what they came from was worse than what they have here. But the kids don't know that. And the kids don't want to be identified as American because that's got too many connotations of, you know, being connected to these uh, white males and stuff. So let, let's, let's come up with a separate identity. And that's when you get these La Raza judges that are coming against Trump. That's when you get this shooter in Orlando. Okay. These people come in like this judge. Heavily pushing La Raza. Push everything for the race. For people outside of the race, nothing. And he comes against Trump. It was about La Raza, just like it's about Islam for this guy. This guy mocked his classmates and celebrated at 9-11. He said, this is what America deserves. And then he shoots 50 people because the second generation hates us the most. Career criminal mastermind Hillary Clinton wants your vote. So let's take a look at what is fueling her presidential campaign. Because a small percentage of shallow, misinformed voters will cast their vote for Hillary based on plastic values determined by her sex, her shallow political experience, and her hollow promises rather than the criminal indulgences Hillary has left in her wake as a corporatized public servant for the hijacked U.S. federal government. Hillary's New World Order cohort, President Obama, utilized the Hegelian dialectic to simply lie out of both sides of his mouth to get elected, racking up countless broken promises, a tactic Hillary wields with abandon. Currently, the latest hellhound on Hillary's trail is the fact that 20% of Hillary's campaign is funded by none other than the royal family of Saudi Arabia. That's right. Hillary is funded by those responsible for 9-11, the country that bought its way onto the United Nations Human Rights Council, while simultaneously beheading its own citizens, bringing the 2016 death toll to 95 as of June 2nd, 2016. Saudi Arabia has a legal system based on Sharia law with a Sharia law mole compromising a potential U.S. president in the form of the Muslim Brotherhood-linked Huma Abedin via her parents and her brothers. True to form, faux feminist Hillary wants to deflect the fact that the greatest woman-hating country on planet Earth is funding 20% of her campaign. Good people will sit there and go to an interfaith gathering and hear women talk about how wonderful that Islam was the first to give women their rights, that Islam protects women. Islam, uh, so listen to all these things that Islam is supposed to be good for women and just sit there and like baby birds when the mother bird feeds them, they drop the worm down the mouth. Meanwhile, ISIS is selling six-year-olds into sex slavery and get Saudi Arabian approval. Islam, when you enter the world of Islam, you enter a world in which everything has two meanings and everything is upside down. And everything you think you know, it's the opposite of that. It's like Islam is permanent opposite day. We and our allies must work hand in hand to dismantle the networks that move money and propaganda and arms and fighters around the world. We have to stem the flow of jihadists from Europe and America to Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and then back again. 
The only way to do this is by working closely with our partners, strengthening our alliances, not weakening them or walking away from them. Trump's words will be, in fact, they already are, a recruiting tool for ISIS to help them increase its ranks of people willing to do what we saw in Orlando. General Petraeus said recently that demonizing a religious faith and its adherents will come at a great cost, not just to our values, but to our men and women in uniform and our national security. But Hillary knows who butters her globalist bread. Zero Hedge reports, as a reminder, it is illegal in the United States for foreign countries to try to influence the outcome of elections by funding candidates. That appears not to have stopped the Saudis, however. Saudi Arabian Prince Mohammed was quoted as saying, Saudi Arabia always has sponsored both Republican and Democratic Party of America. And in America, current election also provide with full enthusiasm 20% of the cost of Hillary Clinton's election, even though some events in the country don't have a positive look to support the king of a woman for presidency. Forgive the bad English. The report did not remain on the website for long, although the Washington-based Institute for Gulf Affairs later republished an Arabic version of it, which quoted Prince Mohammed as having said Saudi Arabia had provided with full enthusiasm an undisclosed amount of money to Hillary Clinton. It's simple. A vote for Hillary is a vote for the continued slaughter and subjugation of American citizens under the emerging acceptance of Sharia law over the values expressed in the United States Constitution. It's really that simple. John Bound for Infowars.com. It's Tuesday, June 14, 2016. 14 days ago, Tim Kennedy, Special Forces soldier, Patriot, was here warning us of imminent jihad attacks inside of the United States. And just 12 days later, his warning came true. Here's a video that we weren't going to air until the future in a film that we're producing that you're now going to get a chance to see today when Ted Kennedy issued his warning. Now, some people can say, hey, you know, tell us something we don't know. I understand that. I know you're informed. I know you understand. We have to get this out to our friends and neighbors and community that are in the dark, that are blaming the Second Amendment for the tragic mass murder in Orlando. And Tim Kennedy's warning you to get prepared, get ready, get a firearm, learn to defend yourself because the government isn't going to do it. The SWAT team stood down in Orlando for three hours. This is outrageous. Our borders are wide open. They're not even vetting the refugees. This guy's father was a jihadi calling for the death of gays. His imam was. The FBI's hands were tied and they weren't even allowed to go after these people. That's because of the political control that Islam has directly out of Saudi Arabia and that Wahhabists have bought off our government from Hillary Clinton to Barack Obama to General Petraeus. Political correctness these days are getting people killed. Heaven forbid you actually say something that's not politically correct, then you're a bigot, then you're a racist, then you're a misogynist sexist. Talk about tolerance. Paris, France, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I think it's a like, you know, city of romance, music, culture, food, philosophy. And they're tolerant for years now, you know, all, a decade. They've been welcoming, welcoming with open arms the refugees from the Middle East. And while their arms have been opened and letting these people in, they've been taken advantage of. Now here we are, 10 years later, uh, the tolerance that they've demonstrated, you'd, you'd think that maybe th they would get some form of grace from the extremists. No, no, they, they see weakness. They're maybe misunderstanding that this kindness is weakness. And in the instance of France, it was weakness. 
All right, we are just getting word now what appears to be a shooting, maybe multiple shootings in, in the city of, of Paris. Police officials there say at least two are dead from an explosion in a bar near Paris Stadium and separately a shootout in a Paris restaurant. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attacks. French President Francois Hollande vowed to use all means necessary inside or outside of the country to defeat the terrorist army. The scene on the ground across Paris uh, appears to be uh, chaotic, but what we are hearing from a French television uh, network, uh, that network, and this is unconfirmed, are reporting that 18 people are dead. Europe might be lost because of their tolerance. Tolerance and political correctness, they go hand in hand. You know, they're two diseases. They're like a virus that is, like once it's caught, you, you just wanna stay with it, but slowly it's eroding and killing you. You're gonna die. That's what political correctness and tolerance is doing to our society. You know, we're trying to be nice. We don't want to offend anybody. And by doing that, we're getting weaker. Stop being and call things how you see them. You know, we have, we have politicians right now that will say anything to get elected. They'll lie at every opportunity. Well, have you always told the truth? I've always tried to. Always. Always. The Supreme Court is wrong on the Second Amendment, and I am going to make that case every chance I get. That's the thing about the, the truth and political correctness. They can't coexist. You either have what's true and what's right, or then you have what's socially acceptable. Those two things are exclusive. They can't live together. Believe in the truth, live in the truth, speak the truth, and for sake, just get rid of the political crisis. We're nine days away from Brexit, whether or not Britain will leave the European Union. Now, this is a story that is not just of interest to those in the UK. This is important to everyone in the world. Why? Because what, where we're at right now with these trans-Pacific, transatlantic partnerships, they're ready to consolidate these regional trade deals into a more consolidated global governance. You need to understand, as we've talked about this with Bilderberg, the EU was simply an intermediate step to a consolidated world governance. So how do we stop that? Well, we've got an election coming up in Britain in nine days. That can stop the EU and the next step of consolidation by breaking Britain out of the European Union, by creating a smaller independent state that is not going to be controlled outside of Britain. And the way we can fight that in the United States is with the election of Donald Trump. But let's take a look at where this is all leading. And of course, underneath it all are the bankers. The New American Report's global financial giants are looking to use TTIP, that's the Transatlantic Partnership, to harmonize U.S.-European laws to remove obstacles to future taxpayer bailouts. They say a cartel of 14 U.S. and European banking interests is working behind the scenes to tinker with the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Agreement to remove any banking regulations. They say they claim to create a regulatory coherence. That's their goal, they say, across the United States and the European Union. Well, when you create regulatory coherence, when you have a harmonization of laws across the Euro across Europe and America, what you're saying is you're creating something that is over and above national sovereignty. And that is the means by which they do it. Economic union, then a more political sovereignty. It's an intermediate step, and they're doing it regionally. They go to economic union, then they go to political control. They're doing it internationally as well. And as New American writes, the TTIP has been designed to follow the EU's example of relentless widening and deepening constantly eroding national sovereignty while building transnational governance that's not restrained by the checks and the balances of national constitutions. And, of course, you won't have any more say in how your economy is controlled than you did in writing those agreements. Now, what's happening in Britain? Nine days out, we see polls show increasing support for exiting, for leaving. This is the uh, Leave campaign opened up a seven-point lead over the Remain People. These, these are people that would stay in the European Union. And at the same time, we had the largest newspaper in the nation, 
uh, urge readers to vote to leave the European Union. That is the uh, Sun, run by Rupert Murdoch. They say, according to a YouGov poll for the Times, leave held a 46% to 39% uh, advantage over Remain. Now, that's a big reversal because just a week ago, uh, leave was one point ahead. So how are the bankers reacting to this? Because we've had a lot of warnings, I would actually say threats, from the German banks, from the London banks. We've had the German finance minister say, aus ist aus. In other words, you get out, you're out. We're not going to cut a deal with you like we did with the Swiss, with the Finns, who are not technically a part of the European Union, but we give them some trade benefits. No, if you vote to leave, we're going to cut you off. So that's a threat from the German finance minister. And then, of course, the British uh, prime minister, Cameron, has said it's going to mean war in Europe. We're going to have interest rates soar. And, of course, we've already seen now that they're starting to uh, panic with this. In Germany, we've seen the yield on 10-year German bonds fell into negative territory for the first time ever. That was this morning. And they say it's due to jitters over the U.K.'s upcoming referendum on whether or not they're going to leave the EU. Now, as they threaten interest rates, understand that we've seen massive scandals in LIBOR. And that's the London interbank rate that is used to base most uh, adjustable mortgages. If you have an adjustable mortgage, uh, they have rigged that rate along with many other things. They've laundered money for the drug cartels, for terrorist groups. They've uh, rigged the currency markets. They've rigged the precious metals market. They've rigged the interest rates. And so, of course, they're going to do things to try to punish them, uh, to try to scare them to stay in the European Union. But just remember this. Remember the story that we had about all the bankers who are committing suicide. We've now got mainstream media, the New York Post, talking about this as well. And they gave some interesting details on one of the banker suicides. Now, they're pointing out three bankers in New York, London, and Siena, Italy, died within 17 months of each other in the 2013-14 time period. It's been a lot more than that, and we've reported on that. But I want to focus on this one particular instance. Uh, this is the Italian banker, David Rossi. He's 15 year, 51 years old. And his institution that he was working with was on the brink of collapse, as they point out. Now, he was found dead in an alleyway beneath his third floor office window. Now, just remember, you know, the document from the CIA saying their preferred method of assassination, easiest thing to do is to push people out three stories or above. Now, the interesting thing about this, they said, is video footage showed that he didn't die instantly. He survived for 20 minutes. And as he was laying on his back, and that's another interesting point, because they say if you jump out of a window, you don't typically land on your back, especially from a three-story window. You're not going to do a midair flip, okay? But if you're pushed out of a window, yes, you would land on your back. As he lay there dying, they say two murky figures appear on the surveillance film. They say two men appear. One walks over to gaze at him. They offer no aid, no comfort. They don't call for help, okay, before turning around and calmly walking out of the alley. Isn't that interesting? Would that be your response to see somebody that had fallen out of a three-story window that was dying? You would just stare at them for a while, talk to them a little bit, and then walk calmly away. About an hour later, a co-worker discovered his body. His arms are bruised. He sustained a head wound that, according to local medical examiner's report, suggested there could have been a struggle prior to his fall. But, of course, they ruled it a suicide, and his widow could not believe the ruling. She said he was killed because he knew too much. And amongst the evidence that she had there was a, an alleged suicide note where he referred to her as Tony. Her name was uh, Antonella. She said, he never called me Tony. So there's an example of how our banksters are doing this. And, of course, we've had them threatening the British people that they will essentially throw them out of the window if they vote to leave the European Union. They need to do it. And if the bankers start to pull that kind of stuff, they need to throw them in the in jail, uh, just as they did in Iceland. Now, in the little bit of time we got remaining, I want to cover what Ed Snowden said three years after he leaked the information about what our government was doing to us in surveillance. Okay, it's been about three years. It was on June 5th in 2013. Now, as he said in Citizen 4, he says, I remember what the internet was like before it be, uh, being watched, and there's never been anything like it in the history of man. He says, I mean, you could have children from one part of the world having an equal discussion where you know they were sort of granted the same respect for their ideas and conversation with experts in a field from another part of the world on any topic, anywhere, anytime, all the time. It was free. 
It was unrestrained. And of course, that is really kind of a picture of the Palantir, isn't it? That we saw in the Lord of the Rings, those seeing stones where you could look into it and you could uh, communicate from afar with people. But of course, as you looked into that stone, it looked back at you. And interestingly enough, Alex Karp, regular Bilderberg attendee, created a company called Palantir, self-conscious references to the Lord of the Rings. And he did that so that he could observe people. Because you remember that what happened is you use that to communicate with other people. The Dark Lord could look at you and could look into you. He could analyze you. And that's precisely what Palantir is doing. And now we've got the NSA director saying, we will gather data from pacemakers, appliances, and children's toys. Remember a few years ago when David Petraeus said, uh, we're going to get information from you about with your refrigerator. Well, of course, the Internet of Things is much larger now. And at this conference, it just happened June 10th in Washington, D.C., the NSA's deputy director said, we're looking at it from a sort of theoretical view. Yeah, we haven't really done it yet, but we're going to get information from biomedical devices. We're going to get it from your children's toys. It says the first time you update software, you introduce vulnerabilities or variables. It's a good place for us to penetrate into your devices. That's the kind of in-your-face spying that we've now come to expect from our government. And a big part of that was Snowden's revelations. And he goes on to say this. He says, if your phone has been hacked, you would never know. He says, uh, for example, if I really want to know, if they really want to know what I'm doing, but the NSA wants to pop in my box, they're going to do it, even though I know what's happening. He says, every part of our private life today is found on someone's phone. We used to say a man's home is his castle. Today, a man's phone is his castle. And he goes on to say, the information that they're getting from you is the same information they would do if they had a private investigator following you from place to place. That's the way you need to understand that. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now we're in Orlando, Florida, where we've been on scene investigating the terror attack that happened at the Pulse nightclub early Sunday morning. We've had opportunities to listen to multiple witnesses, people there, survivors, friends of those who are in the hospital, saying that they heard multiple shooters. And now we have this breaking news from the FBI. The FBI says that the wife of Omar Mateen had knowledge of this attack uh, going to be carried out. She was with him when he bought the ammunition, the guns. She actually drove him to Disney to case the joint. That was another possible location. And she drove him numerous times to the Pulse nightclub. But this is the thing, though. Days ago, when the FBI went and visited her and asked if she knew anything about this, knew that he was going to carry out these attacks, she said no. And now we have this information that, that she did know. We also know that the father, who is from Afghanistan, who was very pro-Taliban, spewed out a lot of hatred about killing homosexuals. Now, we already know about the attacks that happened in San Bernardino. The radicalized wife talked this guy into doing this whole thing carrying out that attack there in San Bernardino. And now we might possibly have another couple that was inspired by the couple in San Bernardino. So this is breaking right now. We're going to give you more updates as they happen. I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. In the wee hours of June 12th, 29-year-old Omar Mateen, a registered Democrat, unleashed a jihad attack on the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, killing 49 and wounding 53 in the worst mass killing event in U.S. history. Well, what Rodney, who is my friend who was a bartender that got shot three times, said in his own words, since he literally hears the sound of bullets hitting people's skin, bullets piercing flesh, bullets breaking bones, people screaming, people... Um, crying, people in pandemonium. Uh, the other guy said that there was bodies dropping everywhere and that the thing with Rodney said that was so crazy to him is that the person that he was serving in front of him, the person he was bartending with, died in front of him. The, the amount of gunshots and like, you know, you were trying to find out, just, I believe that there was more, yes, because so you believe there was more than one gunman there? I, I believe that. Omar Mateen, a U.S.-born citizen, had gradually self-radicalized. He had abused his first wife, yet no charges were filed. Unhinged behavior was reported by co-workers, but ignored because he was Muslim. And Mateen was interviewed by the FBI three times, but never put on any kind of list 
He also traveled to Saudi Arabia twice to visit Mecca. Mateen worked as a security officer for a major DHS contractor as Counter Jihad reports, the Orlando nightclub terrorist who pledged allegiance to ISIS worked almost a decade for a major Department of Homeland Security contractor, raising alarms that ISIS sympathizers and agents have infiltrated the federal agency set up after 9-11 to combat terrorists. G4S uses fortified buses to transport hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants from city to city and from cities to the U.S.-Mexican border. But earlier this month, Judicial Watch revealed G4S has been quietly moving and releasing van loads of illegal aliens away from the border to interior American cities. The security contractor also provides security guards and other security services for 90% of U.S. nuclear facilities. If anyone was a perfect candidate for being put on a watch list by the FBI or the DHS, it was Omar Mateen. Even his father is suspect, who pretended to be president of Afghanistan and also said gays should be killed. And the local imam in the Islamic community Mateen was a part of called for the death of gays. Death is the sentence. I mean, look, there's nothing to be embarrassed about this. And death is the sentence. The same mosque that Hillary Clinton herself blocked from being investigated. Kit Daniels writes, The Fort Pierce Islamic Center, where Mateen worshipped several times a week, was under investigation by both the FBI and the DHS as early as 2011 for ties to a worldwide Islamic movement known as Tablighi Jamal, which was linked to several terrorist organizations. But according to WorldNet Daily, the investigation was shut down under pressure from the Clinton-ran State Department and DHS's Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office out of fear of offending Muslims, according to recently retired DHS agent Philip Haney. And now, Omar's brother-in-law is mocking our Second Amendment rights with his liberal swill posted on social media. Mateen's brother-in-law, Mustafa Abbasan, even went so far as to call Trump a Nazi and a racist. Breitbart reports, Based on 2014 data, the most recent available data from the Department of Homeland Security, the number of green cards issued to Middle Eastern countries increased by 32%. The number of green cards issued to Afghan migrants increased by 32 379% in the course of that single year. Hillary Clinton has made clear that under a Clinton presidency, these numbers will grow substantially higher. Based on the minimum numbers Clinton has put forth thus far, the U.S. will resettle 730,000 permanent migrants from the Muslim world during her first term alone, adding up to be larger than the population of Washington, D.C. Today marks the most deadly shooting in American history. The shooter was apparently armed with a handgun and a powerful assault rifle. This massacre is therefore a further reminder of how easy it is for someone to get their hands on a weapon that lets them shoot people in a school or in a house of worship or a movie theater or in a nightclub. It only took three minutes for Obama to basically blame the American people. What would a real president have said? Take President Eisenhower, for instance. He would have simply told Americans to arm themselves under the Second Amendment. And now Obama has the nerve to call it homegrown terrorism. As far as we can tell right now, this is certainly an example of the kind of homegrown uh, extremism that all of us have been so concerned about uh, for a very long time. Obama, there is nothing even remotely resembling American values or culture in this attack. Stop using homegrown terror for your sound bites. You're clearly blaming the American people for beliefs that originate in the Middle East. They are not grown here at home. This new benchmark of the brutal slaughter of Americans on American soil is a clear indication that the FBI, DHS, and federal government are not only unable to do the job our tax dollars are funding, bottom line, they are growing the radical Islamic invasion. How about that for homegrown Obama? Carlos the Jackal wrote a uh, foreword to an Islamist book recently from prison. Of course, they let him do that. You know, they, he's got like a suite in prison. And it says that only a coalition of Islamist and socialist forces can defeat the United States. And in the Obama administration, we get a twofer. We've got them both covered, raised by Frank Marshall Davis in Hawaii, the communist, 
uh, and then trained in madrasa schools. So we've got both of them in one, folded together in one. Um, after the Benghazi attack, there were hearings the State Department, a State Department official came out with a quote that should be in everybody's mind. The Taliban is inside the building. He was referring to Huma Abedin, Valerie Jarrett, and others who are allied closely with the Muslim Brotherhood. When Obama came in, he had all of the uh, law enforcement and intelligence agency doctrines and, and training methods purged of any mention of Islamic Jihad. Imagine trying to fight World War II, but you were not allowed to say Nazi, SS, Gestapo, or Hitler because it would offend all the decent moderate Germans. That's how crazy it is today. Obama and anyone previously responsible or currently protecting this agenda that has breached our national security should immediately be arrested. The transformation of America has been in the full swing ever since 2008. Now, there's no question we got a hell of a job ahead of us with the Muslim Brotherhood penetration in every one of our national security agencies, including all our intelligence agencies, and as been reported by some, our lead intelligence agency headed by a Muslim convert, this is not going to be an easy task. The longer these Saudi Arabian lackeys are in power, the more Americans will be slaughtered. Stop the madness. Arm yourselves, America. Aggressively protect your First and Second Amendment rights. The globalists are bringing a war to your backyard. John Bound for Infowars.com. Well, that's it for the show tonight. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure and hit the subscribe button. And you can also become a subscriber to PrisonPlanet.tv. And we appreciate your support out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll see you here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.